It seems nowadays that the only things about racing drivers that matter to the fans is the personality behind them and the strength of their Wikipedia article. And sometimes the former takes more of the weight in that regard. So if you were to come across someone with, shall we say, a strong personality, it may not be something that fans would tolerate, nor would corporate sponsors or racing teams for that matter. And I bring this up because for what seems to be the 8 millionth time, Dan Tictum has been dropped from a driver academy and his aspirations of Formula 1 lie in pieces on the floor, acknowledging that his dream of a Grand Prix driver is pretty much never going to happen for him. And the immediate reaction to this was pretty much this. <laughs> But perhaps some of us need a refresher. Why are we laughing at this dude for losing a potential shot at the big time? And does he even deserve that sh Well, I've already partially covered some of it. Don't worry if you're not totally up to par with it. I'll try and fill in the blanks along the way. But now that we're all here, we'll try and piece together the rest of the story. Let's pick up where we left off with the last video, with Dan signing up to the Williams Driver Academy. Now, I thought this was a good move for him, having just been let go by the ravenous cavern of misery run by Dr. Helmut Marco, and into a team that, whilst drowning badly, was starting to come into some nice North American money. There was a lot of opportunity to come out of this, and potentially a seat with a team that needed a good natural talent to help dig it out of the turf. I mean, after George left, obviously. His 2020 racing program consisted solely of a Formula 2 campaign driving with dams. There, he would be with an established team, alongside what can only be put mildly, an established teammate, a gladiator in the world of Formula 2, a fierce warrior that embodied the ethos of a... Oh, fuck it, it was Sean Galal. Bruh. I love you, Shawnee. Embrace the meme. And to team results that year were, with the greatest respect to Sean, predictable. While Sean was drowning at the back with the Satos and the Sam Myers, Tictum established himself as someone who was consistently at or near the front of the grid on pure pace. And while it's not much of a teammate to really compare yourself against, the nature of junior formula racing being deceptively uneven makes this the most fair comparison. Sometimes. For the first couple of rounds at the Red Bull Ring, he put on a pretty good effort, getting points in all four races, including two podiums. Things were looking good at the Hungara Ring, only for a mechanical failure to ruin his chances in the sprint race. Despite that, however, he was P5 in the standings, heading into the two rounds at Silverstone, still a while behind Bobby Schwartzy, but miles up the road from his teammate, which, I admit, isn't the most convincing argument in the history of motor racing, but I mean, I'm trying to play my case here. Qualifying for the next round wasn't brilliant, deciding to nestle himself in the mid-pack, but he drove valiantly to finish P5 in the feature race and would hold off Christian Lungard to win the sprint, thereby taking his first victory in F2. I guess you could say that things were looking on the up, and after having not really put himself in any PR predicament up to that point, people were starting to warm up to this guy, in the same way that one would warm up to Mel Gibson if you ignore what he says. But of course, yeah, this happened. Dan. Don't do this again. And if you're one of the few that's wondering, what do you mean again? Well, a few years before this happened, when Dan was running in British F4, he got involved in a tangle with Ricky Collard. At the same circuit, ironically, Tickton was so incensed by what happened, he passed numerous cars under the safety car and intentionally ran into Collard as an act of revenge. This sort of sh** does not belong on a racetrack, and the UK governing body decided to issue him a two-year ban, although the second year was suspended for 12 months, provided he didn't try any other shenanigans. So to hear these words was damning, although those quotes do need some comment. Context. People took it as if he was threatening to crash into Louis Delatraz. He later clarified that he gave a lot of space. Had he not done, they would have come together. In no way did he mean he wanted to crash with him. To some, it seems as if he was trying to weasel his way out of it. But crash with him and crash into him do carry separate meanings. Because English language. Having said all of that, this placed him under the microscope again. Now people were looking at him in the same kind of light as they did with the other controversies. Which was a shame because it started to overshadow what he was doing on the racetrack. But even there, he was starting to struggle. For the next couple of rounds, he would only score two points finishes, which was obviously not what was expected of him and Dams heading into the season. After all, this was the team that took King Latifi to vice champion status in the previous year's championship. There were a couple of reasons for why this was happening, with the first being in relation to the tyres. This of course came after changing from these rooms to these ones, and yeah, it does make a difference. Having struggled with the softer compounds, particularly in qualifying, before doing decently in the races, but not before having a tricky first couple of laps as the tyres were starting to come in. Having said that, he himself admitted that he needed to negate these issues if he wanted to pose a threat for the championship. The other issue at play was down to the famously reliable Formula 2 car. 
It sucks ass and they need to fix it. Throughout the year, dams were experiencing problems pertaining to the engine. This isn't exactly unique in Formula 2, but where it hurt most was in the Mons around that year. Tictum dominated the sprint race, earning him a second race victory of the year, although he would later be disqualified from the race due to a lack of fuel after crossing the line. While that may sound like a screw up on the part of Tictum and Dams, it was later revealed that the fuel tank had suffered a leak and that, despite Dams taking on a bit more fuel than needed before the start of the race, the tank was virtually empty and that fuel had leaked out and was inside the car. The tank had been serviced just three races prior and it still had issues like this. Magella was initially promising, but that all melted down into complete nothingness, courtesy of a questionable strategic call and tangling with Yuki Tsunoda down at turn one. But he capped off the year nicely by clinching his third podium of the year in Bahrain, finishing 11th overall in the standings. Not very freaking great, I'm guessing is your reaction to that. Although it doesn't necessarily reflect the pace he had that year. His qualifying did need to improve though if he were to have any chance of fighting with the Guang Yu Zhou's and the Bobby Schwartzies for next year's championship. Of course, he would remain in F2 for 2021, this time joining Carlin and paired up with Red Bull Jr. Jahan Daravala. In the time off the track, he established a following on Twitch, playing COD and other things. I don't know, I never really watched his sh but he had a loyal following that did. He just had to watch what he sat on there. But we'll come back to that later. For now, let's focus on how he's been doing in this year's F2 Championship. Basically, he's had the measure of Daravala virtually the whole year in terms of pace. But that doesn't mean to say it's been plain sailing for him, because it really hasn't been. Starting the season off in Bahrain, he was on the pace right from the outset, and has seen that his qualifying demons may have been sussed, but he probably didn't count on Bobby peering up the inside into turn one in the second sprint race, resulting in one of the clumsiest clashes in F2 history. It was honestly just a racing incident, although it's not a great way to start the season. He would redeem himself by finishing second in the feature race later that weekend, which was a nice way to round it all off after those gymnastics earlier on. In Monaco, he had shown his speed once again, qualifying in the top four and winning the second sprint race after Liam Lawson was disqualified for pressing a button too early. He was clearly one of the faster drivers that weekend, but would throw it all away when trying to pass Piastri during the feature race at Larascas around the outside. Around the outside. Around the outside. I'll shut the f*** up now. He threw himself out of the race and a pretty certain podium position and just quickly addressing Dan directly here. What were you doing driving with your phone here? Baku was interesting too. Qualified well, again. He got a decent haul of points in the sprint races, but then the feature race happened and all hell broke loose. Trying to pass on a street circuit is fun enough as it is, but when someone is trying to pass someone else who is trying to pass someone else, it gets messy. Anna did here too. Dan was up the inside of Taylor Porsche for what was basically half a straight, who in turn made a lunge for Marcus Armstrong, and the ensuing tangle sent Tao and Marcus out of the race. After receiving a 10 second penalty, Dan proceeded to vent over the radio, and these sorts of radio transmissions have given him a reputation as a whinger, and someone who needs to sort his attitude out if he wanted to stay in the sport. What I'll say to that is, whinging over the radio is not something that's unique to Danster. That's racing drivers for you. Some of them are the most miserable buggers out there when they're on track. Well, all except Honey Badger. Dan was more or less an easy target in this field. He is to radio what Deleta is to driving. He's not the absolute worst he's ever been, but I mean, yeah. Anyway, he overcame the penalty and such to claw his way back through the field, take the fastest lap, and score some more points with a P8 finish. He was still fifth in the standings and, ironically, closer to the lead than he was a couple of rounds ago. The topsy-turvy nature of the series itself, along with this abomination of a new race format, which, thank the lord, they're getting rid of, has made this championship a bit of a free-for-all in a way. Except for pastry. I'm genetically programmed to abhor Aussies, but that dude is mustard. It just kinda sucks that other drivers have been prioritised. Tictum, though, would finally have a weekend where nothing happened happened to him. In Silverstone, he notched up two podiums and a nice haul of points, still well in the hunt for the title. No prangs, no penalties, just a neat weekend where he showed how damn fast he is. But you know how I mentioned his Twitch account before and that he couldn't really afford to perform any shenanigans? Yeah, that happened. Don't mock the king, dude. Not least because he's driving for the team that you were signed up with. Yeah, you noticed the were in that sentence, didn't you? Yeah, at the beginning of August, it was announced that Tictum had been released from Williams, citing a variety of issues that we'll touch upon later. But in a basic sense, he wasn't going to get an F1 seat for 2022 with that team. As we now know, those privileges went to Alex Albon and Latifi. It was the second time he had been dropped from a junior academy after having previously been dumped by Red Bull in 2018. It should be noted though that the decision was made before his sing-off earlier on. But for now at least, the focus was on the next round of Monza. He was doing nicely enough in the first sprint race before eventually...
You're right, mate. This put him out of the race and forced him to start from the back of the field for the next one, which was a stroke of crap luck. Even more crappy luck came in the feature race when opting for the longest strategy. When Yuri Vips' car remembered that it was overdue for some unreliability, this brought out the safety car, and so all drivers who started on the softer compound got their pit stop done and gathered up behind Tictum, who did not come in for his stop because obviously the strategy didn't allow for it, and so he was in for a painful race that was until Lawson's fire extinguisher prematurely extinguished within his car, blinding him and forcing him to park on the side of the road and bought out the safety car again. Dan made his pit stop, putting him at the end of the queue, but now with fresh rubber with a handful of laps to go. A brief scare with Ralph Boschong almost sent him off into oblivion, but he kept it on the island and eventually clawed his way back up to finish in third place. After another safety car was deployed, when Beckman bent bent Fiscal, Sochi began in the best way possible, with a lights to flag victory that was as commanding as one would want. And his fifth place finish that weekend wasn't too bad either, giving him a nice haul of points, and still kinda in the the running for the title. Although that said, Pastry has quite a stronghold over this whole championship, although his aspirations of winning the championship came with the hope that it may land him a Grand Prix drive. But we obviously know that won't happen now. And I find that to be appalling. I know I make a fair amount of videos on drivers who should be in Formula 1 and yada yada yada, but this dude does have the pace for it. That's all I'm saying. Should he be in Formula 1? Well, I'm kind of bored talking about all that stuff because at the end of the day, it comes down to money and politics. You gotta have those two elements going for you and he didn't. End of. Motorsport is like chicken nuggets. If you like it, never find out how it's made. Some may point out that the content of his character has led to his downfall and I can assure you, he is very much aware that he has screwed things up for himself, having admitted that in numerous interviews and even to me directly. Now, forget racing drivers. How many people in life do you know will legitimately put their hand up over their own flaws? I mean, I've been doing this stuff for three years now and I still won't admit that I was wrong about Sir Lancelot, yet there is a stigma around this dude and I find it slightly ironic that the same people that take the moral high ground in all of this are the same people that will give him hell over social media. It don't matter if you don't like the dudes, practice what you preach. So where does he go from here? Well, there are still two rounds left of this year's F2 championship. Anything can happen in that time. He could win the title or fall into obscurity. I don't know, with how my videos age, the last thing I want is to offer predictions. Otherwise, odds are this dude's gonna get thrown into a gulag or something. Beyond this year, a good option may be to head to IndyCar, cause honestly, that seems like a decent route for all F1 prospects turned rejects nowadays and he'd be heading into a series where the talent actually matters. I mean, it ain't quite the F1 dream, but it might be a blessing in disguise. A place where one's personality don't matter quite as much as the talent they possess. To an extent, as racing fans, that is what matters to us. Seeing the best talent out there, duking it out for top honours, or else he could continue with his Twitch channel and develop his pipes some more. <laughs> Anyways, thank you all for watching. Drop a comment below, subscribe to the channel if you're awesome, and always remember, keep it respectful, be wholesome, don't be a manus, and as always, I'll see you all later.